Um, we uh, kind of took a, a little bit of a, a break last week and we talked a little bit about uh, this idea of um, that without faith, it's impossible to please God. That is in Hebrews chapter 11. I want to, I wasn't planning on going there, but I'm going there um, because it does tie in. Um, so Hebrews chapter 11, I just want to read that little passage again. Um, Hebrews chapter 11, and let's see, it's going to be in verse 5. So it says, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. I promise, I can get louder in him, so he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. And that's a very fundamental verse because it tells us the very foundation of our faith is faith. It's probably why we call it a faith in the first place. It, it comes down to that what God is telling us right here is that the only thing that we have good to offer God, the only thing that he's interested, the only currency that, that heaven operates on is faith. That's it. It's, it's not on good works, although James tells us that, hey, faith without works is dead. He says, you got faith? That's great. I'll show you my faith by my good works. So faith results in good works, but it's still, good works isn't the currency of heaven. It's faith, faith alone. Ephesians tell us it is by grace we are saved through faith. That's right. And that's not of yourselves, so that no one can boast. It's not me, it's not you. I'm sure you guys are great people, but you're not that good. Either I suppose you could say that faith is the currency that you buy good works with. That's a good way to think of it. That is a good way. Yeah. Except it's more like it's automatically drafted out of your account. <laughs> In that case. But anyway, and I, I can't remember right now where it was. Um, I might take this minute and find it. But in that passage, it talks about Enoch. Um, not he, so I think it. If I remember right, it's Genesis chapter 5. But like I said, I'm going off memory here, so don't quote me on that uh, yet. Yeah, it was. It was Genesis chapter 5, verse 21. It tells us a little bit about Enoch. And, and it's just such a simple but powerful thing. I mean, in, in Hebrews 11, it told us that we need to look to Enoch as an example for our faith. And, and here... It tells us about it, his life, and it's it's a sneezing, you miss it, kind of, uh, almost blinking, you miss it. Um, so uh, Genesis chapter 5, verse 21, it says, When Enoch was 65 years old, became the father of Methuselah. And after the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived co in close fellowship with God for another 300 years. And he had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived about 365 years, walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day he disappeared because God took him. So Enoch didn't die. He's one of two people we have in, in the Bible, an example who never tasted death. And so naturally, me being me, I'm like, okay, God, what's the secret? What, what did Enoch do that I need to do? What, what, what can I do to emulate that? What, I mean, we got a whole bunch about the other guy Elijah, we got, you know, practically books of information on him. He was like the biggest, boldest prophet in, in God's kingdom in the Old Testament. And, and so we got information on him. Okay, but what can I learn about Enoch? Well, we got this, this little piece of blinking, you miss it. But man, it's just so powerful. And, and he hits it and he says this simple thing that it was about walking in close fellowship with God. Walking in close fellowship with God. And I'm just like, that is so amazingly powerful. And, and 
we've been going through the book of John, um, calling an overarching um, theme or, or, you know, kind of like trying to make compare it to like the Marvel Cinematic Universe for those of you who are movie, movie goers. Every single Marvel, Marvel movie pitches into a greater story that's being told. And um, John, instead of just taking it piecemeal, uh, I really wanted to get into it and get into the nitty gritty of the book of John. But I, I've recognized that a problem that often happens with doing that is that the nitty gritty has lots of wealth in it. And getting into the details is just powerful. But simply put, we have a problem is that human nature says that we eventually get to the point where we can't see the forest for the trees anymore. And so while it's important and good to get those details, I don't want us to miss the big picture of John. And John tells us at the very end of it, I'm not gonna go there, but he, he tells us in the second to the last chapter of John that he's writing this so that we may believe. And just again and again and again throughout the book of John, you see him hammering this basic idea of belief. Belief in what? Is it belief that Jesus was a good teacher, like so many people these days will say? No, not if you've read the book of John. Honestly, I, I, people who say that, I mean, I understand they, they're, they're repeating what they've heard. And Jesus was a good teacher. I'm not trying to say he wasn't at all. But to limit him to that is to try to put God in a very small box. Yes. And it doesn't work. It doesn't do him any near justice, and, and it doesn't help us either. Because Jesus did not allow himself to be put into that box. Matter of fact, reading through the book of John, you start to see that it's the other stuff that got Jesus crucified. It, it wasn't the fact that he was a good teacher. It wasn't the fact that crowds were following him. Although, to be fair, there was some jealousy on the Pharisees' part, and the, the priests, they were envious of the crowds that Jesus could bring in and the influence he pulled with those people. That was a part of it. But that wasn't why they justified crucifying him. I mean, later on in the book of Acts, you see um, one of the Pharisees, a guy named Gamaliel. I might be pronouncing that wrong, but I never met the guy, so he never told me how to say it. So. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, Gamaliel basically He's part of the, the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of, uh, of the priesthood. And so he's one of the leaders of Israel. And, and they brought in Peter and John. They grilled them and basically told them, hey, shut up about Jesus. And, of course, Peter and John, being who they were, said, um, we're going to obey God before men. And they left. And basically the, the Sanhedrin, we get a small glimpse into what they're saying there, is that, they're saying, we got to do something about this. We got to stamp this thing out before it becomes a problem for us. Mm -hmm. And Gamaliel says, look, guys, don't worry about it. I mean, seriously, if this is not of God, it's going to go away on its own. Because yeah. right. let's face it, you take a look at things that you can compare that have happened in my lifetime. Um, David Koresh, mm -hmm. tragic, definitely. Um, but... There's no more branch Davidians that I know of. All these other people, all these other things, they just tend to go away. <clears throat> That's not always 100% true. Because I can think of a couple um, cults that have sprung up that have stuck around for multiple generations. But mainly is like, if this is just a cult, it's going to fade away. It's going to go away. And, and, you know, as these people die off, it, it's not going to matter anymore. It's going to become irrelevant. But if this is from God, there's not a thing we can do to stop it. So let's just sit back and watch. Maliel was a wise man. Um, and, and that's a lot of what John's trying to say, is that this good teacher was not just a good teacher. He wasn't just somebody prophesied to come down and die 
to save Israel. He was God with us. And that's the point I've been trying to emphasize, that God is with us throughout this. He came down, he walked on the earth, and um, I can remember, what was it, a year ago, maybe two, there was a big dust storm that blew up and, and blew sand and dust literally across the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. And it came, yeah. who knows, maybe some of the very earth that Jesus walked on has fallen here in Comanche, and we've stepped on it too. Who knows? I doubt that's the first time that sort of thing happened either. So we could have been doing it already before that storm. But regardless, the point is that he was God with us. He was here on earth. But that's not the limit of what he was meaning when he was named Emmanuel, God with us. And make no mistake, that's what the name Jesus means. It, it is that God is with us. And so that's a big thing that John is trying to emphasize. That it's not just a good teacher who's been walking around. It's God wrapped up in human flesh, born, raised. He had dirty, whatever they had equivalent to diapers, you know. Um, <laughs> he, he walked. He was hungry. He stubbed his toe and probably was tempted to cuss when he did it. Um, he was real. He was God in human form. And so John does a great job of emphasizing this. The other Gospels have a different point. They're trying to emphasize different things. But John's all about, hey, Jesus is God. And you can't read through the Gospel of John without coming to that conclusion. You have to ignore all kinds of things. Like, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How the book starts out. And then just a few verses later says, And the word became flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And it's that kind of stuff that we see over and over again. And that brings us to where we're at. John has walked us through Jesus' basic ministry. We saw a major miracle with Lazarus just a couple chapters ago where he raised Lazarus from the dead. And now everyone is paying attention. Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, the priesthood, everybody is paying attention to Jesus because this is the stuff that happens normally. I mean, it's kind of one thing to have somebody healed. I mean, that that that's miraculous, obviously, but, you know, if a leper is made well, you know, that's cool. That's great. He came in. That's happened. We've seen God perform miracles without any Messiah being there. But Jesus comes along and starts doing all kinds of things that have never been done before. And so everyone's just paying attention. And so he comes into Jerusalem. You know, you remember Palm Sunday with all those palm branches and people shouting Hosanna. And if you don't know the word Hosanna, it's not a name. It's not a random thing. They're shouting, save us. They are an occupied nation by Rome. They don't like Rome. They're not welcome. And so they want Rome out. And they're asking Jesus to come in and save them. And, and what I read in, in the process of doing my research for this book is that apparently it's not unusual for somebody who is a king like a foreign dignitary or some of some sort someone of high rank maybe like said a king maybe a prince but somebody of high rank to come into jerusalem riding on a donkey this was not that unusual it was not unheard of it was recognized because here's this high dignified person riding up in, in in a humble way. And so basically it was meant to show that I am here, I am for the people. I, I, I want to be a part of what's going on with you. I don't want to be above you, I am with you. And, and they were all for that. That's why they were cheering him when he came in. But the next day, what they were expecting was Jesus to go to the temple and say, okay guys, I need to go get some weapons. We're gonna go throw out Rome. <laughs> That's what they thought was going to happen. Yeah. It's like he had his moment of humility. Now it's time for him to rise up in glory and power and kick out our enemies. It didn't happen. 
And so the crowd started turning against him. And here we are. Jesus has basically rented a room, and he's just there with his disciples. Very select group. These are the people who have followed him through thick and thin for the last three and a half years. Okay? And so he comes in, and he's been telling them some things that are super important. Okay? We've been going through it. And we land in John chapter 15. And so I want to take a look. And I'm not getting very far into it. Matter of fact, I'm getting one verse in on John 15 today. There it is. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. Not my favorite way of putting it. Jesus said, in other versions, I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. And it's a very proud and honored tradition, because let's face it, most people like wine, especially back in that day. That was the only way to guarantee you weren't going to have um, problems in the bathroom because the wine killed any bacteria and water was risky. It still is. Many nations in the world don't have water today that they can drink. It's risky. Wine is a safe solution. And especially if it's kind of mild, it's not a big deal. So wine was a very common drink, and it was very important to them. So this was an honored um, profession. Not everyone did it, obviously, but it was kind of one of those things that was just woven through the fabric. It's a basic understanding. Like, we all kind of basically understand road construction because we got drive through it. <laughs> so he comes in, and he just lays out this basic statement. But he laid out this among several other statements. I'm, and I'm not the first one to come up with this. As a matter of fact, I don't even know how old this is. But somebody found in the Gospel of John what are called the seven I am statements of Jesus. And I wanted to hit those because there's a theme that runs through those that this is a part of, a big part of. And so I wanted to go ahead and hit those. So let's go ahead and let's go to John, I believe it's chapter 5, isn't it? 6. 6, okay. 635. 635. Well, maybe, yeah, there you go. Let's say, let's go ahead and go hit it. All right, John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So he's the bread. If we take him in, we're not going to be hungry or thirsty again. Mm -hmm. Obviously, not exactly a literal statement. But a profound statement nonetheless that Jesus is our sustenance, mm -hmm. that He is what we need to survive. Okay? I got two notes here. That way I don't have to keep relying on while I do to bring them up. Where did it go? Oh, that's right. Okay. I stepped it in my life. Okay, so let's look at the next one. It's in 8, chapter 8, verse 12. John chapter 8, verse 12. It says this. Jesus spoke once more to the people and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to light. Now, basic science says that we can't really survive without light. Light feeds plants, plants feed cows, I eat steak. Okay? So, I can't get along without light. Never mind stubbing toes or hitting my shin on coffee tables or anything like that. It's just a matter of, of we can't see without it, and, and we can't literally, we can't survive without it. All joking aside, we need light. And so they turn off the lights. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that, that is a little better, I got to say. Okay. Yeah. Now, I guess they'll need light. <laughs> we got them off. We got them off. All right. So, uh, verse 13. Verse 13. But you see this, again, Jesus is saying, you know, I'm the bread of life, so you're not going to hunger or thirst without him. He's going to be your sustenance. 
But more than that, he's going to be the very foundation of life because light is necessary. Matter of fact, um, I, I remember hearing one guy I got a lot of respect for. He was talking with a, uh, a an atheistic scientist. And um, he basically said, was going over the, the account of creation in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And uh, Genesis chapter 1, first thing you see him creating is light. And, and he basically walked this scientist through and said, even if you don't believe in the idea of a literal seven-day creation or six-day creation, anything like that, even if you don't believe, he said, I want you to just take a look at the order of what happened. And the scientist stopped and he looked and he saw, and I can't, I don't remember off the top of my head. I didn't plan on going here. But if you look at the created order, science will agree that this is the order that would have to happen in order for life to exist. They may not agree with the account, but they can't argue with that created order. So on a fundamental level, Science still has to agree with Genesis chapter one. And here he is, the very first saying, the very first created thing was light. He's saying, I am the light of the world. You need me, I am the foundation of existence. That's how much. Let's move on. John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse seven. Seven? Yeah, yeah. Seven. Okay. So explain to them, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. He goes on and says, all who come before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. And I get the mental picture of an enclosure that the sheep get to come in when it's time to, and they get to go out when they need to eat. But when the time comes for them to come in, they're safe. Stop and think about it. Being safe is all about being saved from the presence of danger. Mm -hmm. Part of what Jesus is saying there is that basically I am salvation. I am your protection. I, I am your eternal life. He goes on in, in the same passage. So John chapter 10, verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. And he basically, and I love, I remember going through this when we did, and he's contrasting himself with the Jewish leadership of the day who was not willing to sacrifice for the good of the people. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is saying, hey, I am willing to sacrifice, and I'm going to prove it to you. And he does. He lays his life down. And that was the price that was necessary for us to be redeemed. And it's just such a beautiful thing. So let's move on. Let's see. It's, let's move to chapter 11, verse 25. Chapter 11, verse 25. This is in the middle of, of the story of Lazarus, him, him being raised from the dead. And so Jesus is talking with one of his sisters. And in verse 25, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Hmm. And he's telling us that life, this, this existence is, is, I mean, not, it's nice. It's good most of the time. Not to say it's not that it doesn't have its bad times, but for the most part, life is good, right? Well, it's not all there is. That this 20, 30, 50, 80, 120, however long we live, this is just a starting line. This is like the first step of eternity, however long it is that we have. And so he's trying to tell them that there's life beyond death. And that's something that we need to know, because let's face it, is there anything that our culture fears more, that every culture fears more than death? Yeah, nothing. There's nothing that we're more scared of. There's nothing. 
time and time again, and I'm not trying to be overly critical, but like in churches, what I hear when people come and they pray in a group setting, so often I will hear them asking for safety. And it's very natural. We don't like the idea of dying. Even as believers, we know up here that there's life after death, that we have eternal life as believers in Christ. But like I said before, honestly, I don't look forward to the transition. Um, and I'm betting you guys don't either. No one likes the idea. No matter how it happens, it doesn't sound like fun. And so we try to kick that can down the road as far as we can. But that's the starting line. Jesus saying, hey, it really is. I am the resurrection and the life. I did. Thank you. I'll get it later. Um, all right. So let's move on to John 14. John 14, 6. Um, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's it. It's exclusive. That he he got to come through Jesus. There's no other way. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's a hard statement to hear, especially in, in our culture. I've been hearing since I was a kid about how that's just not right that you need to let other people believe how they want to believe and all faiths are equally valid and while there's some validity to them in the sense that they often help people they give them a sense of community it's beneficial even most atheists will still say that religion is a beneficial thing certainly not all um, but a lot of them will and so in that way, there's some validity to them. But ultimately, what we're told is that if you want eternal life, again, you got to come to Jesus. And that's a hard statement to hear. And it's, I can't think of one that our culture hates more. Mm -hmm. It's part of what makes them want to dismiss yeah. Jesus mm -hmm. these days. It's why they want to set him in the box of he was a good teacher. Mm -hmm. Because if, it's, if he's more, suddenly statements like that mean something. Yeah, and that's, that's not something they're willing to do because let's face it, the hardest thing for all of us ultimately in becoming a Christian, it's not so much believing that there's a God or believing that Jesus died for our sins or anything like that. Ultimately, it comes down to I have to give up control of my life. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you guys, but I think I do a pretty good job running my life. I'm here, Andy, but it's hard. <laughs> Dale. Talk up in front of everybody. <laughs> and it is hard. And it really is. I mean, who wants to give up control? I mean, we got, you guys probably all know a control freak who just cannot give control up of anything. Maybe you work for that guy or girl. I don't know. But regardless, you probably know a control freak. But I hate to break it to you. Even the most passive people among us who are the least controlling, we still have areas of life to be controlled. Because you know what I've learned? I'm a passive person by nature. I am. But I've learned that my passivity is my attempt to control things. It's weird. It's stupid. It's illogical. But it's there nonetheless. Passivity is a way to try to control things. We like control. Yeah. So the hardest thing I've seen, and, and what I usually see is people come, you have a conversation with you, you lay out all the things that you address, all their arguments and everything. And, and so you can come and you can present them with all the facts they need to come to faith. But in the end, you're telling them, you've got to give up control. And they're like, eh, no, I, I, still, I still like those previous things I believe. I know you addressed it all. And so it's reasonable for me to come to faith. But what they don't say is, I can't give up control of my life. Some of them were honest enough to say that, but not many. Most of us don't even realize it, but it's there nonetheless. 
And that brings us to the final, the seventh one, which is what we just read. John chapter 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. I like my other version better. But he's the true vine. And you look at all these statements. I'm just going to read them back for you real quick. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true great vine. Are you reading these just out of the Gospels? Because remember, he did say, I am that I am. He is, but this is a different one. Yeah, you're right. He did say that. These are... Uh, I think that I think these kind of reference that and draw on that um, because that that's the single boldest statement where Jesus gave that he he was saying that he is God I am that I am uh, before Abraham was I am that's the right way to say it um, so yeah I think all these kind of reference that and so I think he's trying to draw this idea because you stop and you think about it if he were just a good teacher no matter how good a person he was you can't be all this stuff and not be God. I'm sorry, there's no person who can supply all my needs. My wife is awesome. I've got a great, great wife. I, I mean, I, I struck gold. I, I struck platinum. Um, but she can't give me everything I need. She cannot. And if I try to get everything I need from her, I've changed her into an idol in my life. No person. Matter of fact, I dare say that every single person on this earth cannot give you everything that you need. Even if the rest of the world decided to focus on you and your needs, they still couldn't meet them. We are. We are super needy. You thought it was just you. <laughs> Your mom. Your mom, you know it's not just you. And you're married to boot. So anyway, we are super needy. And the simple fact is that, that we're created that way. Why? So that we'll turn to God. He's the only one who can supply all our needs. Amen. Yes, sir. He's it. And so what I looked at when when and I figured out when I read through all seven of those I am statements is that it talks about a couple things. It talks about his divine nature. Okay? He's God. No one else, no human can possibly be all these things. And it talks about his, the essential nature of his role in our salvation. We need him. It really comes down to that. We need him. And so the job of the believer then comes in this shape is that we have to start shaping our life around jesus every piece of our life how we parent how we are a good husband or a wife how we're a good son or daughter how we're a good friend how we work how we play everything starts to wrap itself around jesus when we're doing things right why? Because we realize he is the bread of life. He's, he's our sustenance. He's the light of the world, which means that he gives us everything fundamental to our existence. He's the gate for our sheep. We are the sheep. He's the gate. He's our protector. He, he's our salvation. And he's also the good shepherd. He's looking out for us. He's caring for us. He's making sure that we, we get what we need. He's a resurrection in the life, that when life ends, he is the beginning, the new beginning. He is the way, the truth, and life. He is the exclusive path to God. And he is divine. He gives us everything we need to produce fruit. Everything he asks of us, he gives us what we need. Everything we're created to need is found in him. All of our wants, we sometimes get those twisted and mixed up, but ultimately, if you untwist them and trace them back to their source, they're aimed straight at God, at Jesus. Every single one of them. We just find different ways to express it that aren't right. Like I said, we twist them, we misaim them, but if you, if you 
get things straightened out, it all points to Jesus. He's at the center of everything. 